Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's really my great pleasure um, to introduce our uh, two uh, special uh, uh, speakers for today. Uh, we have uh, two of our own, um, Dr. Alex Leitner and Dr. Shuk uh, Pak, uh, who are going to present uh, exciting work that they are doing, you know, here. So let me give you, you know, a, a, a for those who are not uh, familiar uh, uh, with them. Um, Alex attended medical school at University of South and subsequently did his residency and fellowship uh, with us, and he had uh, served as our chief nephrology fellow. Uh, following the completion of his uh, fellowship, Alex uh, took a somewhat unique uh, path and completed an, the Blum Institute Fellowship in AI and machine learning. Uh, he joined our faculty as assistant professor last month. Congratulations, Alex. Um, and he has multiple interesting projects using machine learning, and we are going to hear about some of these today. Um, then our next speaker for the second part of our grant rounds, uh, Dr. Shuk Park, graduated from Hanyuang University Medical School in Korea and moved to the U.S. in 2007. Um, she did a nephrology fellowship in Emory, followed by a transplant nephrology fellowship here at Northwestern. Um, she spent some time on an NIH 32 postdoctoral fellowship program and got a degree on the Master of Science in Clinical Investigation here at Northwestern. Um, and after her fellowship, she joined our faculty as an assistant professor uh, in 2021, and she currently works on developing non-invasive biomarkers, um, also doing a US RDS data analysis uh, for uh, patients with kidney transplantation. She also has a special interest in machine learning, um, and we are going to, uh, we are looking forward to hearing, you know, uh, both. All right, so thanks everyone for joining me on uh, World Kidney Day, the most important day of the year. Hopefully uh, we can look at each other's fun socks after. I have nothing to disclose. And so uh, this lecture is gonna be a little bit different. Uh, I just sort of show of hands. Here, here knows how like a protein electrophoresis works. Yeah, most of us I think have read a paper or seen, you know, uh, some electricity applied to an agarose gel, but how many of us have, you know, have heard about machine learning and, and neural nets here? But how many people know how a neural net model sort of finds its parameters, makes the model, and sort of gives a, you know, what, what we're looking at when we're talking about a neural net? Yeah, so yeah, I'm going to talk about some of my projects, but I'm actually going to focus sort of half my time about how the models are actually made so that at least we have a basic understanding of what's being done when we're looking at a neural net model as these things come out. So first, uh, I'm going to go through sort of tiered layers of, uh, you know, ad advances in machine learning, starting with clustering, then looking at logistic regression, then a neural net, and, con and, and finally a convolutional neural net. And then we'll hear from Dr. Park about uh, how artificial intelligence is being applied in kidney transplantation. So artificial intelligence is really a program of any kind that is there to make a decision in place of a human. So you know the fact that creatinine turns red on your epic at 1.2 is sort of a knowledge-based artificial intelligence. It's a codified rule, but you know now the computer is somewhat intelligent in turn telling you that that's an abnormal creatinine, ranging from that to you know a, a self-driving car that can use artificial intelligence in a lot of ways to process images and then make decisions. Although you know until very recently those decisions were also just about as coded as that red creatinine. You know the images would be fed in and then. Uh, you know, there'd be a rule like if something's coming towards you, break. And it wasn't as advanced, but now uh, cars more recently in the past year and a half are actually using neural nets to actually learn human decision making. And machine learning is when you learn those rules based off of a data set without actually codifying exactly what the rules are. So why are we using AI increasingly? One, because we have more and more healthcare data that's codified, and so we can input these into models and identify things that are going on in our patients that we wouldn't have identified before. Before, 
how science works was you had to have a hypothesis, you had to generate an experiment to prove that hypothesis and, and uh, sort of see if, if what you thought was or wasn't true. Now we have so much data that we might have hypotheses we would never think of, uh, but, but that data is still relevant. Like, uh, you know, if you put in somebody's creatinine, proteinuria, but also every other part of their medical record, you might find that white blood cells or, you know, white blood cell count has a component to play in CKD, even though there'd be no physiologic basis or reason to invest a lot of time to test that, but you might find a feature like that that is actually relevant when you have enough data to pick out that, that little small signal. Um, you know, by applying AI, we can remove the burden of unspecialized tasks like, you know, maybe uh, replying to patient messages or, uh, on time or, you know, codifying the urgency of patient messages or, uh, and then we can remove the burden of specialized tasks like reading pathology and MRI if nobody's available to, to do that or at least make it quicker. Um, and then finally, we can codify healthcare rules. And I think we've seen in the past that healthcare is inherently biased in how we provide it. Uh, at least AI models, you can, you know, pose questions to them and see, you know, is it dealing with these, mo with these problems in a biased or unbiased ways, in ways that you can't necessarily uh, interrogate a physician or, or, you know, other parts of the healthcare system. Um, and so first I'm going to talk about clustering. Clustering is a way to evaluate groups with similar traits. Essentially, you just have to choose what traits you're interested in and how you represent them sort of numerically. Then you choose an equation to measure the distance between those numbers, and then you evaluate which samples are close enough. So, you know, say you choose a couple of people's creatinines and their age, and then you evaluate, you know, how different those creatinines and ages are and, and put them into groups and then say, you know, what do these groups have in common? There's a lot of different algorithms you can do that. You can measure the distance in a lot of different ways, um, but frequently we use this sort of as hypothesis generating uh, and say, you know, these groups are very similar in the ways I know about. Let's see sort of are they also similar in ways I don't know about. Uh, and some things that have, you know, the common ways this is used in society are uh, what's called collaborative filtering or when you go on Netflix, you, you know, are suggested some titles, you watch five things, it says, oh, other people who watched these five things also watched this. So that's sort of the hypothesis is that because you watched the first five things, you'd watch the next one just like everyone else. Um, you know, ways this has been used in medicine famously here at Northwestern is in the area of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Dr. Sanjeev Shah sort of looked at uh, a, a lot of parameters, echo parameters, clinical parameters, uh, and outcome parameters, and hospitalization uh, in people with heart failure and found, you know, in particular patients with heart failure with CKD sort of belong to their own group of, of, bad, of people that who have bad outcomes with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Um, and so, Again, going quickly through this again, more to focus on, uh, you know, the implications of, of these models. Uh, here's a, a, an experiment I did with Dr. Srivastava and Dr. Uh, Prasad Puttamarthi at uh, North Shore um, uh, using radiomics. And so radiomics are sort of numeric features pulled from any imaging study. And so, you know, one that I think a lot of us would be familiar with is like a Hounsfield unit that tells you the density of uh, the, the amount that X of the x-ray that uh, the pixel absorbs compared to water. Um, and so, you know, radiomics are any number y you can pull from there, uh, from a picture. And so what we did was we took some functional MRIs of the kidneys, uh, first ADC maps, but also uh, others functional MRI series on 30 patients with diabetic CKD and 10 individuals uh, that were healthy, had no known CKD uh, and no diabetes. And we extracted parameters from the images on uh, just the renal cortex. Um, these parameters were some simple things like the mean pixel value, the variance of the mean pixel value to more complex, like how the pixels related to each other uh, in space and, and the rate of change of that uh, relation in space in order to pull you know, up to 54 values per image. These values sort of, nobody knows what they mean. They're not really codified on renal images anywhere. Um, and so we wanted to explore if they correlated to CKD or not. And so what I did was clustered these values together. And so uh, what you can see here uh, is the values, each, each line here is a patient and each column is a, a set of values. And so there's 54 values. It's not really important what the, what the values were, but again, they're just numbers pulled from 
you know, how the pixels relate to each other in the image. Um, but once you have them represented as numbers, you can actually say whose numbers are closest to each other. And so um, here on the side, you can see this dendrogram or this tree link of which patients are closest to each other. And so, you know, splitting them in two, these patients on the top have values that are close to each other, and these patients on the bottom have values that are close to each other. And so what you can sort of see is this top group has, you know, very low values for this first set where the bottom group has higher values and the top group has higher values for this second set of numbers and, and lower values for this other set. Sort of like a fingerprint or uh, showing that these values kind of, you know, look the same in some group of images and, and not in others. Uh, and so what I did after that was take do these patients have CKD or not? And so these patients with this set of values from these radiomic principles actually all had CKD. Um, this group of patients down here, you know, half of them had CKD and half of them didn't have CKD. And so this is very important because, uh, you know, it's showing you that these numbers that we just pulled from the image that might not look any different to the human eye, these numbers are capable of representing a disease process or something that we can interrogate further. Now, CKD is a very sort of simple thing that we can delineate to, but what else could be contained of these numbers? Could we see uh, different progressive progression of kidney disease? Could we see how they respond to treatment differently? Could we see, uh, you know, uh, when we expect for them to progress to ESRD, uh, other, other things like that. And so there's a lot of potential that maybe these numbers have other information that aren't clinically available right now. Um, and then this is just an example, um, but just showing that what we started with are MRIs of the kidney pictures, but we converted them into numbers. And once you convert them into numbers or traits that represent them, you can plot them in space. And again, once they're plotted in space, you can say certain ones are closer to each other, whereas your eye might not be able to group them so easily. Uh, and sort of this ability to turn pictures and words into numbers is very important to uh, processing data, uh, you know, non-traditional data uh, in, in machine learning that we'll talk about later. And so now we're going to go through sort of the same sort of set of patients, but look at logistic regression. What else can we predict with the numbers that we've created? Um, and so logistic regression, I'm going to use sort of as a, a, a ground base on how we learn the rest of machine learning because uh, of the regression step, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. And so logistic regression is essentially coming up with this uh, uh, function between 0 and 1 in predicting you know, if they have a 51% chance, you say, yes, they will have the outcome. If they have less than 50% chance, you say they won't have the outcome. And it's making this line and fitting this line appropriately. And so, you know, the equation for one variable looks something like this here, uh, where there's an intercept, a midpoint of the equation, and a slope of the equation. Uh, but you have to come up with those, those numbers. And so the way that logistic regression comes up with these numbers is using a loss function and gradient descent. And this is actually how most of the modern machine learning algorithms actually come up with the parameters for a neural net, how they, you know, come up with uh, ways to, you know, read images, see pictures, all everything, make decisions, everything. And so, you know, this is a little complicated, but I'm going to summarize it in a few words. Um, so the first important step is that you have a loss function, and all that means is you have a way to compare your model that you're making, so the equation that you want to represent the data, to the data itself. And so this is the most common loss function called cross entropy or uh, uh, sum of squares. Uh, but essentially all it does is it takes each point in the data, subtracts it from what your current equation will predict, and say, you know, does that for every single point and says, how different are they? If they're very different, your equation's not very good yet, and so your goal is to get this number smaller and smaller so that your equation more closely matches the actual data. And so by plugging in, you know, your current equation into this loss function, uh, you get a, 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 a gestalt of how good your equation's currently doing. But you want to keep making the equation better, and so what is done is actually we know that the derivative of any equation is the slope of the equation. And so if you take the derivative of the loss function, you can get the slope, you go you sort of down the slope in order to get to a smaller number. And so you can make changes to each of these uh, variables by taking the derivative of this whole function in respect to each variable present in the function in order to say, I should move each variable this way to get the equation better. 
Um, and so by doing that, you're making your overall loss function lower. And so that's very powerful. It takes a lot of iterations to get to the right function. And there's some caveats, and you won't always get the best function if you don't do things correct. But uh, you know, using this, you get to what's called a minimum of the loss function. And that is you know, where, where your values of your equation that you're looking for are the best. And so going back, again, that would be where this intercept is the best and wh what slope of this line is the best in this sort of simple model. And so doing that with the renal functional MRI maps that we talked about earlier, we use actually three different functional MRI sequences and plug these in to ask two questions. One, could we determine with these numbers who has CKD? And so actually the mean value of the pixels in the renal cortex of the um, ASL, arterial spin labeling map or blood flow map here, actually was completely capable in this data set, which again hasn't been verified in another uh, set of studies uh, to determine if somebody has CKD or not. So just by having this, you know, scan, we can tell that somebody has CKD, but you know, we could already do that with a blood test of creatinine, so not as interesting. So what we wanted to do is can we tell if somebody is a rapid progressor versus a non-rapid progressor by looking at this picture? And we just define that by, a, you know, a rapid progressor is a GFR loss of more than three a year over the, the, the two years that they were in this study, and a non-rapid progressor is not as many as three per year. Um, and so what we did was combine the variables, you know, using, uh, looking at these studies, and we found that actually using variables from the ASL map and the R2 star map, we actually could tell who was a rapid progressor versus who wasn't a rapid progressor, um, which, uh, again, if you compare it to 24-hour urine protein, which actually has about a 93% on its own uh, area under the curve, is a little better. And again, this isn't to say that this is a perfect study, but it is to say that, uh, again, maybe there's a little bit of extra information that we don't have just based off of these clinical parameters that might exist uh, in these studies. And again, if we had more samples than just these 24 samples that did both of them, that again, maybe we could get a little bit better signal on this, you know, extra information that we're looking for. All right. And so next we're going to talk about my uh, next project, but we'll start with neural nets. Um, so a neural net um, can make an extremely complex equation to combine parameters. And so instead of just B0 and B1, those two parameters, you know, neural nets can, you know, have anywhere from one to bigger, the bigger ones have, you know, a billion parameters, chat GPT with a trillion parameters, or if, anyway. Um, so you can make an extremely complex equation. So instead of just, you know, one S-shaped line, you can have a line that makes any shape imaginable through any number of planes uh, and, and really, you know, spe specify like what you're doing with the data. Um, you find the optimal combination of parameters with that same algorithm I talked to by taking the derivative in response to the loss function with regard to every one of those million parameters, you can update it slowly and slowly until you get to it, uh, until you get to a minimum, uh, in, in which case your model should match your data. Um, and your model should match the world or the, the problem that you're looking for if you use correct features and variables to represent uh, the model. So if you're trying to, you know, look at somebody's kidney disease, you probably want creatinine and proteinuria in there. If you're doing it without that, you're probably not representing people's kidneys as well. Um, but you can also include other things like, you know, maybe income or zip code or number of blood pressure medicines or things like that and get more, spe more specific uh, modeling of, of what people are actually like. Um, and then the other is enough data is present. If you only have 20 people, you're not going to be able to tell the difference between, you know, these, these other uh, signals. So, again, what somebody's systolic blood pressure being from 140 to 145 might not be a big difference if you only have 20 people, but if you have 200,000 people, that could be a huge difference and you, that would be a relevant piece of data to include. Um, and so again, so how these are actually connected is sort of, you can think of these, these are called nodes, and you can think of each one of these as an equation like we talked about. And so this could be something like four years of EGFR, each plugged into, you know, six equations here. The output is plugged into another equation, and all of these are outputted into another equation to create this mix. Again, this mix lets you draw a line in any shape possible. Um, and then what you could get is maybe the next three years of GFR, I guess, or, or something like that. Um, uh, one problem with this, like I said, a line could be in any shape possible, and so if you have a big neural net and only 20 points, you could easily just draw a line that goes through every single one of the 20 points. This line has a loss of zero because 
it's exactly hitting every single data point, but it doesn't actually represent what's happening because if you had somebody at this point, you'd expect them to sort of be at the average, like right here and not right here. So in the real world, your line wouldn't actually be close to what's happening. This sort of line would be closer to what's happening in this actual data because of how sort of standard deviation works. And so there's a lot of mechanisms both with the gradient descent update step uh, to sort of minimize the amount of what's called overfitting, meaning you're, you represent your data very well, you've learned and memorized it because, you know, if you have 20 pieces of data but 100,000 parameters, you can just memorize what those 20 pieces of data say and always output them again. But uh, so by putting sort of rails or restraints on this as well as texting with very good external validated data, uh, you, can, you can make sure these models work well. Sorry, I'm looking for a clock here. Okay, five more minutes. So wh what I did was take a... Um, a language model with 100 uh, million parameters um, that learned what uh, language is. So essentially by putting in as the input to these words and then the next couple of words, it actually can, just like I showed you before with the radiomic principles where we've turned the images into numbers in space, by putting the words and then the, the words around them here, you actually start to learn the context of words, what words mean, where they should appear, and so that's called a language model. And so by using a language model and adding in an extra step uh, up here, I made something to read uh, dialysis tweets. And so originally what I wanted to do was use Twitter sort of as a sort of a vital sign on the community. And so um, we, we know actually that you can use Twitter to predict flu outbreaks actually quicker, about two weeks quicker than the CDC will report flu outbreaks. Um, and so the other thing, you know, you also online things like people were losing their smell and couldn't smell candles. And so candles on, on uh, Amazon were getting a bad review before people realized the COVID outbreak was occurring. And so there's a lot of ways in which social media actually can be used to sort of tell what's going on in population health. A five minute, okay. Um, and so I wanted to sort of see what I could, you know, any hypothesis I could generate on dialysis by reading dialysis Twitters. But what I actually found was 60% of tweets about dialysis are just actually from doctors posting about papers and saying, I went to a dialysis shift today or, um, you know, this fact about dialysis in China. So actually what I want to do is first get a data set that I can look at. And so what I wanted is a language model that can read this and tell me, is this from a patient or not? Because I, I can't read through half, you know, I can't get anything if half my tweets are about something else. And so I actually put another layer on that 100 million neural net parameter thing and looked at 1,000 tweets. And so I personally coded the, if it was about a, you know, a patient's experience or if it was about, um, you know, something else, a doctor, a hospital, somebody, or a nurse talking about their day, so something else. And actually was able to increase it from instead of, you know, 60% being uh, professional, now only 18% uh, were professional. So it's a lot easier to sort through that. And this is just sort of an example, um, you know, this person, their mother's suffering from dialysis, they don't have any money and COVID's causing them problems. But you can see other things like uh, during, this is May 2021, I think, so the, there was a problem with the gas shipments, I think, with a, a leak in Mexico. And so gas prices were stopping people from getting to dialysis. And these are sort of, we have a vulnerable, pop, vulnerable population. And so knowing, you know, if dialysis patients are particularly affected by a current event, maybe we could make their care better. Um, and then finally, I'm going to go through this quickly, uh, but next is what's called convolutional neural net. And so this is another way to process images. And so instead of each of these nodes being an equation like, you know, log of x or whatever, um, each of these nodes is now a picture. And so what happens is what each node guesses is, is how similar is this picture to the picture I'm being provided. Uh, and so... Um, you know, here's an example with an EKG. So here's the, the T wave of the EKG. It might say, well, the P wave is like 50% similar to the T wave. Uh, this part, you know, this, no, no, nothing here is maybe 1% similar. And then the T wave itself that I copied is 100% similar. And so using that, it can actually gauge the picture and say, is this picture present? But it doesn't only do that. It still does that same iterative process we talked about with gradient descent and actually makes this picture the perfect picture in order to get whatever outcome you want. And so the outcome that I wanted was to take an EKG with atrial flutter and say, 
is their flutter present or not. So we have plenty of EKGs. I got 20,000 EKGs diagnosed with atrial flutter and said, and then 30,000 without and made the delineation between do these EKGs have flutter or not. They went through a one and a half million parameter neural net where again, this looked at, the first layers looked at pictures, then it looked at pictures again, and then it made equations like the log of X equations in order to, to tell um, is flutter present or not. And so actually this was able to tell if Flutter was present with about 99% accuracy, which compared to the Marquette rules base, so essentially it says like if the T wave looks like this, um, then it's Flutter, uh, which is about 76% sensitive for Flutter in the Marquette rules base that's currently used. And so, um, and then the final part is sort of, you know, how do you know how your neural net's working? I can't look at a one and a half trillion parameters, but one thing I can do is actually cut it off after it's, pra after it's processed the pictures and say, well, what part of the picture do you think is important? So the, here's an EKG with flutter, but why are you calling it flutter? And it says, well, something here I see is flutter, but really something here uh, in this depression right here, this wave shouldn't be there that looks a lot like flutter. This wave right here shouldn't be here, so that looks a lot like flutter. And so even though you know it's hard to dissect these algorithms, there's a lot of ways to tell sort of where the decision making lies and, and what the bias of them is doing. All right, and now I'll let Sook talk hopefully with some time. <laughs> So I, ha I don't have anything to disclose. So, so artificial intelligence has a great uh, potential in kidney transplantation because we have a wide adoption of electronic health record system and we have uh, abundant data environment including national registries and extensive imaging and histopathologic uh, and immunologic data. And then there are a recent emerging like a molecular pathology and biomarkers including genetic data. So also kidney transplantation itself is complex and interactive uh, clinical features which conventional uh, statistics cannot handle very well. So this is a graph from the, the PubMed. Recent years we see tons of uh, AI in kidney transplantations and uh, this is kind of a uh, most commonly studied topic like uh, rejection diagnosis and prediction and graph survival, graph survival and patient survival prediction, allocation weight list management and immunosuppressant management and delayed graph dysfunction prediction. So I will review the like most recent papers, like five years like papers. So uh, recent years that histopathology has a great advance and uh, great advance with this deep learning uh, algorithm. So we will go over like three papers. So this group uh, published that uh, in CJs in 2020 about they uses that this convolutional neural Neural, neural network to use that uh, uh, immunofluorescent features. They, when we do a kidney biopsy, we commonly do a immunofluorescent studies, and then pathologists go through this, like a, the immuno, uh, immunofluorescent biopsy, and they give us the scores where that the um, IgA popped up. So they look at the 12,000 uh, immunofluorescent images, and uh, they come up with that, um, like uh, they can differentiated that like a segmental, seg whether this, the, the immunofluorescence was segmental or global or locations, it's, it's, a, it's a mesangial, mesangial area or capillary wall. So it was 117 times faster than human pathologist. So it's, it, this, this kind of work will be used as like a, to reduce the uh, labor intensive part for the pathologist. And, uh, but this paper is, uh, not um, externally validate, so uh, performance might drop later, but uh, oftentimes that this kind of AI mo model, the performance can drop because of the difference in the staining method or scanning of the images and um, do not have enough data. So it will be uh, more, uh, like they will be study more about this kind of improvement later. So the other thing is the, the this, 
paper is from 2019 from Korea. Uh, this group of researchers look at the like uh, immunofluorescence. That's a similar thing. They look at the C4D, uh, C4Ds in the peritubular capillaries. So they look at the like initially they process that uh, region of interest. They look at the whether their C4D is positive, and they go through that uh, the first the convolutional neural net, neural, neural net, and then they found that the uh, region of interest, and then they also run the, another the neural, net, neural, neural network, and then they found out that there, whether there is a peritubular capillaritis. So this is pretty, I mean, re the decent uh, performance, like uh, sensitivity 0 0.88, and pr positive predictive value is 0 0.938, and it was basically very fast and la less uh, labor intensive and uh, very reproducible. But the same thing, the performance might drop in external validation cohort. This paper was published in uh, 2019 in JSON. They, this group now look at the actual data. They trained that uh, uh, convolutional uh, neural network algorithm with the whole the 40 slide of whole slide, and then they come up with the um, they look at the Quantify, they quantify that the different section and they classify the tissues, like whether this is glomeruli or this is sclerotic glomeruli or tubules or inter interstitiums. And then performance overall, like other, um, the CNN uh, or other like machine learning uh, the algorithm, they are pretty good at picked up the normal glomeruli, like 0 0.95, but they're pretty poor at like to pick up the abnormal diseased tubuli, like a 0 0.48. And then um, overall, like a, um, the weighted mean uh, with the tubuli combined at 0 0.88. So it's like the same thing. They will, this kind of study will be, the algorithm will be like a, a, like a more developed later, a, a little bit fine-tuned later, and then they can use it as a, like a, uh, what is that, uh, supporter, supportive system for pathologists at this point. So, and then uh, we look at the normal and a little bit of abnormal findings. So this group of uh, people, they published that uh, uh, retrospective multicenter proof of concept study. They look at the 5,844 whole slide image. They, in, they look at the PAS st stain, HNA stain, and John stain, and then um, they they tried two different kinds of CNN algorithm. The first thing was they tried the serial CNN. So initially they look, the, build up the machine, the machine, the C, use a CNN and they classify disease, disease kidney or this is normal kidney, and then they run the, another uh, the model and then they look at the classify the rejection or other diseases like glomerulonephritis or recurrence of disease or some infections. And then overall, their like AUROC is 0 0.87. They're pretty good at to detect the normal. And then rejection, they, the AUROC was like 0 0.7 and other diseases were 0 0.75. They also tried a single CNN and then they just tried to uh, figure out whether this tissue is a normal or a rejection and other disease. And, um, they were pretty good at pick up the normal, but the rejection is about the same, 0 0.76, but they're not that great at the 0 0.5, and then when they try the external validation, performance was uh, dropped significantly in the single CNN. So uh, it will, I think this kind of uh, algorithm will, will see more and more. And then in our group, we are looking at that, this, um, the, we look at the PAS st staining and to predict that the, uh, BAMF score. So this the, this is uh, Dr. Lee Cooper at the Northwest New Our Center, and then initially he developed that um, machine learning CNN pro the algorithm based on the Emory data, and it, when when he was in Emory, and then he came to the uh, Northwestern, which uh, we are external validating that with using that uh, CTAT08 data. So we have uh, digital slides for the CTAT08 pop. The patient, so we, uh, he was testing this like uh, his algorithm on our CTAR08 data, and then I score sensitivity is still kind of 0 0.63 and 0 0.94 specificity, and T score is 0 0.74 and 0 0.82 specificity. But it is very fast, like less than 10 minutes. So we submitted to the ATC this year, and it got accepted as an abstract. So uh, he's working more on the other scores at this point. 
So recent, the, the progr fast progress in like uh, biomarker studies. So there are a lot of like a biomarker and molecular and clinical data using the clinical molecular data. They are reject the diagnosed rejection and uh, rejection predictions. So this group of paid, they are from the Europe and they published 2019. They, they used a machine learning um, algorithm, this elastic net, this like a random forest, to pick up that the, like eight genes uh, assay to diagnose AMR. And it was multi-center trial and then their I AUROC showed that uh, almost 80% uh, uh, to detection rate for AMR. The other group is, they, this is quite a uh, uh, prominent uh, paper in our field. So this MMDX currently is kind of commercially available. They uh, use a kidney biopsy, but they die, instead of the pathologist reading the kidney biopsy, this machine read the, uh, the microarray data, and then they uh, diagnose that uh, the cell, T cell mediated rejection and AMR and instead of using that uh, one algorithm, they use a 12 different um, machine learning algorithm and they combine everything. So, and this algorithm showed a similar performance as a human expert with the balanced accuracy of 93%. The other group also the, used the, developed this, the genetic markers uh, using the formal fixed and paraffin embedded tissues, and then they use RNA seq, and they diff, they use a different uh, machine learning algorithm, and then uh, uh, to pr to pr diagnose a TCMR with uh, like a it's a overall okay performance with that, and then um, this was recently published in AJT. So in we in our pathology report, we see a lot of BAMF scores, and this group of uh, people, they put it in a BAM score and the clinical data like uh, proteinuria, creatinine, and your protein, the, like uh, their original disease data and their like histologic data. And then they use this extreme gradient boosting cl classifiers. So they, um, and they also they did the external validation you know, with a large number of data. And um, mean AUC for the AMR diagnosis was 0 0.95 to 0 0.97, and they're pretty good at uh, TCMR2, and then they're like, if the, the, if the diagnosis is pretty accurate to greater than 96%. So, and then next uh, topic is pre uh, rejection prediction and ready up uh, di diagnosis using function uh, MRI. The, they use a diffusion weighted MRI like uh, uh, radiomics. So overall, the their the claimed accuracy is pretty good, like 94 percent, 92 percent. But the uh, problem is that in a in a rejection diagnosis, there are, in this paper they did not uh, mention any clear definition of rejection. So we don't know whether this is. Uh, cellular rejection or antibody reje media rejection. Uh, so this kind of engineer paper is the problem is that uh, we don't know whether this kind of rejection or diagnosis were well validated or not. And oftentimes it is small sample size based. And then graph survival and patient prediction is very commonly studied uh, topics. So in 2020, 2019, there are the, the, because of the COVID pandemic, a transplant centers stop doing kidney transplant and then, or, or they just do a, like a selective number of the kidney transplant. And the, at that time, the, uh, this, group, this research group was come up with the, like a machine learning, uh, the simulation combined machine learning algorithm, whether this is safe to go through the um, kidney transplant during this COVID pandemic. And then they built a model and they gave a prediction like uh, scores. During this simulation, they used this machine learning algorithm to evaluate the, uh, the aspect of modeling. They basically, they choose a different weight in each patient's uh, risk factors. Their conclusion was immediate ki kidney transplant is still beneficial even though during the pandemic. But when the, the case fatal, Rate, fatality rate is greater than 50% with uh, COVID, 
the it, K2 will be harmful. So, but this model was based on the li limited COVID data. So probably in the future, they will probably update more data on this like a uh, uh, simulation uh, prediction models. So, and then there's, uh, because there are too many like a, like a positive hype about machine learning. They, they claim that their machine learning is better than the conventional uh, modeling. So this group, this is, they are from the Johns Hopkins group, Doris Egev, and they're a very prominent research group. They look at, they compare, they compare that the, they compared the conventional regression model to the machine learning algorithm, and they look at the different uh, transplant outcome, like a delayed graph function in one year, the the acute rejection and graph failure, and the death rate, and they use that SRTR data because they have tons of patient data, and they they try to compare different machine learning algorithm, and they compare with the uh, conventional the regression models, but the performance was basically very similar to the conventional um, the statistical model. The problem is this kind of study is this SRTR data is not granular enough because they only have like a one set one time point of creatinine. One they're like a, at the like a their patient like a condition at the time of registry. So this register data has like a, a lot of limitation to use this machine learning. Pro, uh, algorithm because of the granularity, and then oftentimes their performance is very similar to the the, the conventional statistics, and they're not that great either. So, and this is the, the quite prominent paper paper was published in 2019 in JSON. So it's they use that um, clustering method, like a, uh, the Dr. Leidner talk about that clustering. So. In um, kidney transplant, the transplant glomerulopathy is kind of non-specific diagnosis. So when we have when we see the TZ in our the kidney biopsy, we assume that their prognosis is pretty poor. So this the this group look at the uh, 552 biopsies from the 385 patients. They use that that they build that the machine learning algorithm. Uh, using the pathology findings like IFTA or like their history of rejection and creatinine and proteinuria, their HLA data, they fit and then fit into that the algorithm, and then they found that the five different types, the arch archetypes, and that they have uh, different like a the like graph survival. In conventional uh, statistics, t the tra transplant glomerulopathy has a same graft failure. They will kind of progress like this, but in this group, they have a different, some patients have a pretty good um, graft survival, even though they have diagnosis of TG. So it's kind of new thing, and they this group fit into this model into their the machine learning um, algorithm. They're they are, probably they will sell it in a near future. So uh, next topic is the Allocation and waitlist management. So this group of the researchers published uh, ensemble of random survival forest with Cox professional hazard model. So they basically said the combine that conventional statistic model with the machine learning uh, model, and they compare with the, our current like EPTS uh, uh, estimated post transplant survival using UNOS data. Again, when you use this kind of national register data. They're, because not granular enough, the, when they compare two conventional statistic model with the, the machine learning, their performance is very similar. In this paper, they claim that their model is better, but 0.02 is it's better. So it's like it can be com like a reverse later. So it's, so you should look at when you look at this kind of paper, you should be very careful about their interpretation. So. Immunosuppressant management is another topic, but it's not that really huge in the machine learning and kidney transplant at this point. They use this machine learning, machine learning algorithm in using the and uh, and they feed into this genetic polymorphism and they predict the tacrolimus bioavailability or predict the future uh, prediction uh, future tacrolimus level. So it's kind of showed a decent 
uh, performance, but the problem is that there are uses is a very small number of patients and that it was not externally validated. And then the last uh, part is uh, delayed graft function. Uh, so a lot of our kidney transplant patients have the delayed graft function after kidney transplant, so there are some effort to identify that risk factors and identify that the potential DGF patients. So this, the Costa group, they look at that the, their data in uh, donor data. So they look at the donor clinical lab and uh, like a, their like a blood pressure, their, whether they use that vasopressor or how's their blood sugar. They check, use that this elastic net and neural net, and then find out that that when they the, their MAP was low, and when they are on the like a vasopressors, the, their risk for the uh, DCF is higher. And then the other group, they use the UNOS data at, to pr predict the future um, DGF and use the, all those, the pre-donor and recipient data and fit into the uh, model. So, they, but the, their like AUROC is kind of okay, 0 0.73 to uh, 0 0.7. So at this point, can we use artificial intelligence in clinic care? It's, it comes with, the, uh, yeah. So. We're not sure at this point. So when we develop the artificial intelligence algorithm, so whether we should critique, we can critique that um, their model. So whether this data set is from the extensive data set or if there's any chance of bias and racial disparity, because there's a concern about this big racial bias and disparity because poor people or um, underserved the, or the like, uh, racially, like African-American does not show up in our data where they don't seek the care that often. Sometimes they are kind of drop off from our training data set. And then when we see those kind of patients that the machine learning algorithm based on only white people or in that we cannot pick that the, the African-Americans, the uh, characteristics. So bias is kind of huge. Um, in, uh, problem in the uh, artificial intelligence model development. And then also when they look at the uh, mo model and development and validation, so we make sure that their the model was ex externally validated or not. Because when we just w look at, when we train the data, we, the machine can memorize all the data point and then they will give spit out like 90% accuracy or 95% accuracy, but it can be overfitting. So that's why, so external validation is very important. Sometimes that the, uh, the performance can drop in the external validation uh, process. So th still there are good amount of limitation existing in artificial intelligence, whether the quality of data is good enough to uh, produce that good uh, model or whether this is biased or not, or this kind of machine learning algorithm really provide the quality of care or improve the quality of care. Sometimes this constant alarming or the noti notification is basically we block that, you know, ignore them, ignore them. So really helpful. And then the, the algorithm is really um, was validated externally. And then how to incorporate into our clinical flow is also important question. And also, who is going to pay for that, this kind of AI applications? And then if there is any frequent in update, what should we do with this? So this is a huge limitation at this point. So future uh, development of this artificial intelligence, we need to have a extensive good quality data. And then we should improve or avoid disparity. And it should, the AI algorithm should be tested in a large and diverse population. And then it is have to be uh, incorporated into our EHR system and monitor its performance. Because in case model predict the wrong outcome, so who is responsible? That's also another legal aspect of the, this mach machine. And then currently, this machine learning is considered as uh, the the device, so they need to get that go through the FDA approval at this point, and then uh, cost reduction is questionable whether it's this AI imp application actually reduce the cost or increase the cost, or whether it's really increase that uh, improve the care uh, for our patients. Okay, so.
this is our uh, conclusion. So interest has been increased in uh, AI in KT, but um, it is useful to identify the complex relationship in extremely heterogeneous and large data set beyond human abilities. But um, currently, the, there's a lot of uh, rapid advance in histopathology and molecular biology and biomarkers. So in the near future, I think this, the histopathology might come very soon, and the molecular biology is already like a, uh, the, you, we are, can use it commercially at this point, and biomarkers also can use that. Uh, commercial at this point. Okay, so still is heavy lifting, a lot of heavy lifting. So any questions? We'll... Yes. I think that histopathology is kind of the first field, I think, because uh, a lot of images are already digitized, and then uh, probably f hundred per the, the fully like um, machine learning oriented the, the diagnosis of rejection or the kidney disease is kind of still limited, but it is like a, the it will help the help the like pathologist to process faster like uh, the slides. So they can come up with, you know, the, those kind of labor-intensive stuff, like look, uh, review that the uh, immunofluorescent, the C4D, and yeah, those kind of st stuff, and then biomarker study. Yeah, I think biomarker will come very soon. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the the imaging sort of numbers we had weren't pictures, so you could say, we could look at each of the numbers, like, for instance, the mean pixel density, you could say, you know, the color of the scan actually does correlate to kidney disease, so, like, if the color of the kidney looks this way, um, they have kidney disease, which I don't think a radiologist probably knew right away, um, but... Alternatively, if you had more scans, what you could do, like, or with, for instance, the pathology, you could use that same method where you take the pathology slide, and I think even some of her slides showed this, but if you stop the neural net partway through and look at which parts of the picture it was focusing on, those were like those squares in, in, yeah, yeah. in Sook's slide. So you could do that with MRI images as well. It just, we only had 40 images, so it's not really, a, I think, an appropriate method. So that's why I kind of went through uh, when, as my data sets got larger, my my algorithms got bigger. <laughs> I think so because especially the like IFTA, so we, the, when the pathologists read that the IFTA, they just guess it, right? The, they guesstimate that number, the 25 to 50 percent. But with this machine learning algorithm, they can give you exact number of the percentage, and then it will can can be reproducible because they can test it different slides, and then yeah, they can give that objective numbers for that the histopathology, yeah, findings, yeah. Yeah, I think I think the biggest. 
hurdles to that right now are that the data sets aren't terrific. Um, you know, uh, histopathology is very nice because it's sort of uniform data, but even still the intensity of the staining and things like that can vary. Um, there's tricks to say, like, I trained on this intensity staining, but if you give me a few with low intensity, I can modify the model a little bit. So there's tricks to make it even work externally, even when it wasn't trained on that data. Um, but even like, for instance, uh, x-rays and things, just processing the images to make sure that you're going to let an engineer touch an x-ray, uh, you have to make sure the dates are off and all those things. Those are all problems actually still being worked on, how to do that for very large data sets reliably. Um, you know, people have gotten better at it, but it's still very hard to even touch the data. And then when even like the, that, that's at least more straightforward. I need to get the name off it. I need to get dates off of it. Um, it's hard to get big enough data sets with clinical data too, um, because in health systems like ours, we have five different hospitals. There's probably 90 different ways we, pr we report urine protein. Um, and so it, it's very hard to compare those and you either throw out a lot of the data that just doesn't look right or uh, again, so I think once we solve the problem of getting the bigger data sets together, especially the imaging, I, I think it's very possible that, you know, it could count the number of white blood cells in a, in a rejecting kidney or something like that, and that could be very clinically relevant, and a pathologist would never do it. Um, so I think that possibility exists. We just need better data and a good way to clean the data.